Welcome to this Introduction to Mindfulness Meditation for Stress Reduction mini-podcast. My name is Kate Partridge and I'm a clinical psychologist and a teacher of mindfulness meditation with many years of experience with my own personal daily practice. Now as a health professional, you're constantly dealing with the normal mental suffering that human beings experience when they're faced with the reality of life. And the reality of life is we often don't get what we want and we often get what we don't want. And we all get old, we all get sick, and we all die. This reality is highly unsatisfactory, but it's unavoidable. And it causes mental suffering of some kind in just about all of us. One way of dealing with this suffering is provided by a mental training called mindfulness meditation. If mindfulness meditation is new to you, you may wonder if it's just a new way to relax, or perhaps it's some kind of flaky way to space out and disconnect from reality. In fact, neither of these is the case. Mindfulness meditation is a well-established mental training that has been shown repeatedly by research over the past 35 years to be extremely helpful for a wide range of psychological and physical problems that are caused or exacerbated by the stress and suffering of daily life. It's also important to understand that mindfulness meditation does not involve or require religious beliefs of any kind nor is it a form of psychotherapy or a medical treatment for curing physical illness. First of all, what is the mindfulness in mindfulness meditation? Well, what mindfulness is not is the kind of automatic pilot state of mind in which most of us spend much of our waking hours. In automatic pilot, the mind wanders and we're quite unaware of what it's doing. We simply react automatically to whatever happens. We may notice for a moment what's happened and then we just roll on mindlessly again, barely noticing where we've just been. And where we have just been very often has been chewing over whether something is good or bad, or we've been anxiously planning the future, or rehashing some past situation in our memory. And when our minds are crowded with these constant automatic mental processes, it makes it very difficult to pay attention to the actual experience we are having in the moment. In contrast, when you're being mindful, you know what your mind is doing because you're consciously paying full attention to whatever is arising in the present moment. You're able to hold it in awareness without judging it as good or bad, but simply seeing it as it really is right here and now, not clouded by thoughts and reactions. And when you can do this, your experience of the present moment can become very rich, clear, and insightful. Although we all naturally have moments of mindfulness, it's also a mental skill that we can deliberately cultivate through this mental training called mindfulness meditation. This practice is is what is at the core of a very well-known mental training program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, or MBSR. The MBSR program was designed in 1979 by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, an MIT-trained molecular biologist working at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Kabat-Zinn was an ardent practitioner of mindfulness meditation and also of yoga. He knew from his own experience how powerful these practices were, and he wanted to find a way to share them with people who really needed help, such as the population of chronically ill patients being treated at his hospital. So he designed a structured eight-week training program in what he called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, or MBSR, and he invited the hospital physicians to refer patients to it. This course involved eight two-and-a-half-hour classes and a one-day session for a total of about 26 hours. In addition, and very importantly, participants were expected to do mindfulness practice every day at home for at least 30 minutes. Kabat-Zinn quickly realized that the course was helping many of the participants. And because he was a scientist, he knew how to design and publish research about the program, which brought it to the attention of a wide range of health professionals. And so, over the past 35 years, this training has been introduced in an increasing number of hospitals and other FET medical facilities all over the world as a useful adjunct to standard medical treatment. In addition, researchers have been learning more and more about the positive effects of mindfulness meditation on physical and mental health, both medically and in workplace and schools. We now know that when people practice mindfulness meditation on a daily basis, their mental and physical health can improve significantly. 
Before I continue, I'd like to let you know that accompanying this podcast is a 15-minute guided meditation that will give you a direct experience of a basic mindfulness meditation practice. Directly experiencing and practicing meditation is by far the best way to understand what it is. Simply reading about it or hearing about it will never, ever take the place of directly experiencing it. So now I'd like to briefly describe the active ingredient in basic mindfulness training, so you can start learning how to focus in a calm, non-reactive and clear-minded way on what your mind is doing as it's doing it. In the initial stage of mindfulness meditation, you deliberately focus your attention on the physical sensations of your torso expanding and then releasing as the breath breathes in and out. These sensations provide the anchor point and home base for your attention. Every time you become aware that your mind has wandered off, and this will happen very frequently, you simply let go of what you've been thinking about and refocus your attention back to being present right here and now, waiting for the next in-breath sensation to begin. You'll go through many, many repetitions of this cycle during the course of a 15-minute meditation practice. These repetitions are exactly analogous to the reps that are practiced in weight training. Many people mistakenly believe that mindfulness meditation is about stopping or suppressing thoughts in order to maintain a state of perpetual calm or even bliss. As a result, they feel that they can't meditate or that they would never even try because their minds won't immediately stop thinking and reacting, and they certainly aren't feeling blissful. But in fact, if you had a mind that was so quiet that your thoughts never took over, you wouldn't need a practice like this. So if your mind is full of unruly thoughts that won't settle down, you are a perfect candidate for this technique. Now let's consider what happens when we start to train the brain in this way with the basic repetition of returning the attention to the breath sensations. Every time you repeat any kind of physical or mental behavior, the neurons involved in that behavior become thicker and more strongly connected. This is what enables us to get better and better at whatever it is we're training to do. So when people practice mindfulness meditation on a regular basis, there are significant changes in the structure and function of their brains, as shown through the technology of neuroimaging. For example, in long-term meditators, there's an increase in the volume of gray matter in the prefrontal cortex, and this is an area that typically shrinks with age. This is an important finding that suggests that meditation might inhibit age-related frontal cortex deterioration. Meditators' brains also show increased gray matter and thicker neural connections in the areas associated with attention, sensory processing, learning and memory, the awareness of internal bodily sensations, and emotion regulation. These physical changes in the brain are accompanied by changes in the way that the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala react in times of stress. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that we rely on for conscious reasoning, planning, mental control, and self-regulation. It seems that it's locked in a power struggle with the amygdala, which is our survival alarm center. The amygdala is exquisitely alert for danger signals from the environment, and it's the seat of our fears and our stress response. The amygdala can respond to perceived threats within milliseconds, much faster than the prefrontal cortex is able to respond. In addition, the amygdala has access to information that's not available to the prefrontal cortex. As a result, the amygdala is able to inhibit the functioning of the prefrontal cortex, resulting in instantaneous and often over-emotional stress-triggered responses that cloud the judgment and result in behaviors that we later regret. Research with long-term meditators shows that in them, the amygdala actually becomes smaller in size and the speed of its reactions slows down. Also, the connections between the amygdala and the rest of the brain are weakened, so that its impact on the entire system is attenuated. At the same time, meditators report less fear and decreased emotional reactivity. And the more that meditators have practiced, the stronger is the positive correlation between the increased volume and strength of the prefrontal cortex and the weakening of the amygdala. Over the past 35 years, hundreds of clinical and applied outcome studies have reported the benefits of a regular daily practice of mindfulness meditation. 
not only in medical settings, but also in work and educational settings. And here are some examples. Practice daily, mindfulness meditation can benefit people with a wide range of physical health problems, especially those that are exacerbated by stress. These problems include heart disease, high blood pressure, chronic pain, insomnia, gastrointestinal difficulties, and psoriasis. While mindfulness meditation does not cure cancer, it has been shown to help patients cope much more effectively, not only with their cancer symptoms, with also, but also with chemotherapy and with the psychological distress and uncertainty that accompany the illness. Chronic pain patients who meditate regularly report a higher tolerance for pain, with a better sense of acceptance for their pain and control over it. Their mood may improve and they feel less anxious and depressed, and often they'll start using less pain medication. From a psychological point of view, people who have a regular daily practice develop an increased sense of optimism and well-being. They're less emotionally reactive and they're better able to regulate their emotions and control their actions. They experience less stress and less anxiety, depression, worry, and rumination. Their capacity for empathy and compassion increases, thereby enhancing their social and relationship lives. From a cognitive point of view, Meditators find that their working memory improves and their thinking becomes more flexible. It's easier for them to focus on relevant stimuli and to tune out irrelevant ones. In the world of work, these emotional and cognitive benefits translate into enhanced job performance and decreased burnout. In educational settings, when students begin to practice mindfulness meditation regularly, their academic achievement can improve, in part because they find it easier to focus and pay attention. When children are trained and encouraged to practice mindfulness skills, they tend to become more resilient. They're more able to cope with bullying, and they show less aggression and fewer behavior problems. In 2003, Richard Davidson and his team at the University of Wisconsin published a landmark neuroimaging study of employees at a Midwestern tech company. This study indicated that meditation can benefit the functioning of both the brain and the immune system. The study built on earlier research that had examined the ratio of left to right brain activation. It was found that greater left brain activation was correlated with increased positive affect, with a faster recovery from negative affect, and with a tendency to approach new or difficult situations rather than to avoid them. This earlier research had also established a positive correlation between the presence of the more optimistic left brain signature and a more effective functioning of the immune system. In the 2003 Davidson study, the experimental group took an eight-week MBSR course and was compared before, after, and at follow-up with a control group. By the end of the eight-week meditation course, the meditators showed a significant increase in the ratio of left-to-right brain functioning, and they reported a greater sense of well-being compared to the control group. Among meditators, there were also significant increases in antibody titers to influenza vaccine, indicating a positive effect on the immune system. And in the meditating group, there was a positive correlation between the size of the left hemisphere activation and the size of the antibody response. In other words, it appears that mindfulness meditation tunes up the brain's ability to be optimistic and confident in the face of stress, and at the same time, it enhances the effectiveness of the immune system. Still, it should be noted that mindfulness meditation is not a panacea, and it's not the only way to increase well-being or to reduce stress. In particular, it's not recommended for people who have a lot of unresolved trauma. This is because when these people begin to focus on inner experiences, they can become flooded by previously blocked memories and emotions. And even for the ordinary meditator with no such trauma experiences, Meditation is not intended to be a blissful or perfectly relaxed experience. Actually, like exercise, it can sometimes be uncomfortable. This discomfort comes in part because when you begin to slow down your mind and really pay attention to what is there, from time to time you are likely to discover difficult or unwanted sensations, emotions, or memories, and these can simply include being bored by the meditation practice but the practice trains you to work skillfully with these normal moments of human suffering by paying compassionate attention to them 
and not by avoiding or suppressing them. When you as a physician begin to understand how much suffering your own mind can create for you, you may experience more understanding and compassion for the suffering of other people in general and for your own patients in particular. In conclusion, mindfulness meditation is not just relaxation, and it's not a way to space out and escape from reality. Instead, it's a gentle, persistent, and powerful training in being fully present and calm with whatever is happening in your life, whether this is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Over time, you're likely to experience a growing sense of balance and equanimity that opens you up to a richer experience of your life. And the research findings are very clear. The people with the most strongly established daily practice of meditation are the ones who benefit most from it. For more information about how to begin your own meditation practice, you can go to the guided meditation link that accompanies this podcast. And thank you for listening.